Okay, sorry, we were off there for a second. We're going to go in here in just a moment. All right, well, we are going to go ahead and get started. So for those of you who are on, thank you so much uh, for joining us this evening. And I'm really excited to talk to you guys about a really timely topic this time of year, especially I feel like if you're in North Texas the last couple of weeks, which is um, training and competing in the heat, uh, which is something that I think we all have to deal with at some point or another. So one of the questions that I always like to ask when we're talking about heat is sort of what qualifies as hot, right? And because hot is really relative, right? It's relative to um, the types of temperatures that you live in. It's relative to um, the types of temperatures that you normally train and race in. You know, hot or heat can be dangerous um, at as low as 80 degrees. And that's dangerous. That's not even just performance impairing. That's when it can actually be dangerous to your person, um, especially with high humidities. And so, you know, for an athlete who maybe does all of their training at 50 degrees, and then they go into a race that is 75 degrees, that is going to be for their body and what their body is acclimated to a hot race. Um, obviously, below 50 degrees, it's unlikely heat will be an issue. But in full sun at high exertion, an athlete may still feel its impacts. And so it's really important to understand that heat is relative to what we've been training in. You know, here in Texas, at the beginning of the summer, 70 degrees might slow us down. At the end of the summer, we might feel great racing at 85 or even 90 because our bodies are acclimated to that. Um, so now that we understand that heat is relative, I want to talk a little bit about, okay, well, what happens when you are exercising in the heat? Okay, and there's a few different things that happen, all of which have an impact on your performance and your safety at times. Um, so the first thing is you tend to experience an increase in core temperature, what we call hyperthermia. Um, this causes a few um, sort of performance reducing effects, including um, decreased muscle endurance, uh, your body switching to utilize more of carbohydrates for fuel versus fats. This is really key to my um, to like long course or Ironman folks who are needing to utilize more of the fat. Just know that heat can impact that. Um, it causes your blood to pull on your limbs, which causes a decrease in your blood flow um, to the heart which obviously for endurance athletes who are trying to get fresh blood to the muscles um, to provide them with oxygen and nutrients to create contractions, that is crucial. Um, and your body, of course, is utilizing more water and salt to cool itself via perspiration, so we're also more likely to dehydrate. And of course, we know that every system in the body um, only functions properly at full hydration, and so the moment we get one or even 2% dehydrated, we're experiencing this decrease in performance. Um, so that's the first thing that happens when you're exercising in heat is this increased core temperature or hyperthermia. Um, so the second thing going along with um, us utilizing more water and salt is potentially dehydration. Dehydration leads to decreased VO2 max, which means our body's ability to utilize oxygen to create energy. And also, um, again, decreased blood flow. Um, so as the blood kind of becomes thicker and more viscous, it's not flowing as efficiently to the muscles as maybe it was before uh, we got dehydrated. We're going to give one second to uh, my bike tech downstairs who is cutting something, and then we'll start again. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so we've got hyperthermia, dehydration. Michael Hooper would just like to make a note that Lovick 70.3 is going to be hot. That is accurate. So if you're doing Lovick, I'm glad that you're listening today. So finally, dehydration. And then finally, the body is trying to cool itself, um, hopefully, if you're exercising in the heat. And there are a few ways that the body will try to cool itself when you are not exercising. Um, so the first is radiation. 
um, which is your primary cooling method when you're at rest. Uh, and that's just heat loss via infrared waves. And so an example of that would be you have a shirt and you put it on and when you take it back off, it's, it's warm. And that literally is your body letting go of heat into the shirt. Um, another way is conduction. And so that is, you know, if you're losing heat by touching a cooler option uh, object, and we'll actually talk about how conduction can be helpful in races or in training as well, you know, through the use of like the cool wraps or you know, putting ice on your head. Um, convection is losing heat through movement of air or water molecules. So like if you're under a fan or if you are in the pool swimming or cold water. Um, but radiation is the primary method when you're not training. And the primary method for cooling when you are training is um, sweating or perspiration. Um, and your body has all, all of these ways to cool itself in regular temperatures. But as you exercise and get hotter, sweat is going to become your primary method of cooling. And as the sweat evaporates, heat is pulled out of the nearby blood and skin, allowing the body to cool. Give me one moment, because I'm going to go talk. we got some noisemakers. I'm going to go see if we can get them to turn it down a little bit. All right, thank you guys for your patience. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so this is what's happening to our body when it's hot, right? We've got um, potentially hyperthermia, increased core temperature, we've got dehydration, and then we've got the body trying to cool itself, and specifically during exercise, trying to cool itself during perspiration, but can certainly be helped along by these other methods, um, like we talked about conduction and convection. So before we get to just kind of the performance side and the recovery side of heat, I do want to talk briefly about some serious dangers of exercising in the heat without proper precautions. Um, the first is what we call heat syn syncope, and that actually is loss of consciousness due to heat. Um, and that one is primarily bad because obviously if you lose consciousness, especially if you're on the bike or you're running, you're in motion, um, it's easy to get injured during the fall. Um, the second is heat exhaustion, and, and heat exhaustion is... Um, you can come back from it, um, but it can be a really dangerous condition if you try to continue training through heat exhaustion. Um, heat stroke, this is obviously a much more dangerous condition. Um, and we'll kind of talk about what are, some, what are some signs to look for when to take a break. We'll talk about that towards the end. Um, and then uh, hyponatremia is one of the four things that can happen. And hyponatremia is a little unique because it's actually – it's a heat-related illness, but what it really is is it's lack of sodium in your blood. And so even if you're taking in water, you aren't able to absorb the water because you don't have enough sodium. And we'll talk a little bit more about hydration later on. Um, but hyponatremia can have similar effects to other heat illnesses and can happen because you're sweating out sodium and not replacing it, even if you are replacing water. Um, and heat exhaustion, heat stroke, hyponatremia, all of these are serious dangers that can put you in the hospital. Um, so like I said, later on, we're going to talk about warning signs for knowing you know, when to stop versus just, you know, try to treat some of the signs of, of um, heat impacts. And these are the reasons why it's really important to stop, and we'll go back to that in a moment. Okay, so let's talk about, now that we've kind of said, okay, here's what happens, what are some potential training and racing ramifications that you can run into that are caused by heat? And remember what we said, heat is relative, right? So 80 degrees on the race course can be super hot. Those of you doing Lubbock this weekend, it's going to be hotter than 80 degrees, and there's not going to be a lot of shade. You're going to be very fully exposed. Um, so that is going to be an environment where we are at danger of heat illness, and we're certainly probably going to experience some performance impacts, even if we don't have a heat illness. Um, so potential things that can happen. So first of all, from a training standpoint, or even a racing standpoint, increased recovery time in between sessions. So when you are training in the heat, it does put more load on your body um, because your body is not only having to go do the workout, but it's having to do all these extra things to prevent the impacts of the heat. And so a lot of times if you do a session in, at 40 degrees, if you did the same session at 80 degrees, it's going to be harder to come back from. Um, and so you kind of need to um, take precaution for that. And recovery doesn't necessarily even mean, it doesn't have to be recovery time, but it can mean, hey, I have to be more intentional about doing cryotherapy after that session, or I need to be more intentional about rehydrating after that session. You're going to have to pay more attention to the recovery, and put more into the recovery of a hot session versus a cold session because of the impact that it has on your body. 
Um, you are going to have it heat, and this is very difficult for all of us as endurance athletes to accept. You are going to have decreased power and speed in the heat. There's a reason why PRs don't happen at 90 degrees. And I need you, especially if you're racing Lubbock this weekend, I need you to just take a deep breath and understand you will not be quite as fast if it is 95 degrees as you would if it was 70 degrees. Um, and that's not because you're not a good athlete. It's not necessarily because you're having a bad day. I know, Michael, I agree. It's not because you're having a bad day. It's because it's freaking hot. <laughs> and your body is not only having to work to go fast, it's also having to work to cool itself so that you can keep moving forward, okay? Um, you're gonna need to carry more water and sodium. So this is a logistical challenge, right? That, you know, if it's cool, maybe I only need 25 ounces of water on a 56 mile bike if it's 40 degrees but if it's a hundred degrees on a 56 mile bike I might need 60 ounces and I'm also going to need more sodium to go with that water as well I might need to remix my water halfway through because I don't want to carry 60 ounces on my bike I might need to carry salt capsules to supplement that um, and so I'm having to carry more um, and then finally of course there is again this greater risk of, of dangerous heat related scenarios Right, so the four big things that we're going to be impacted in in terms of training and racing, um, increased recovery efforts or time in between sessions, um, decreased power and speed, having to carry more water and or sodium, um, and then of course this greater danger um, of heat related scenarios. And the, the biggest thing where I see one of these, and I see it every year as a coach because I have all these athletes that you know during the cold weather, they'll be getting faster and stronger and faster and stronger and faster and stronger. And then all of a sudden the first like warm day in North Texas comes and all of a sudden everyone's like, I'm having a really bad week. Training's not going very well. I, you know, what's going on. And it's not that everyone's just having a bad training week. It's that we just had the first heat wave and everyone's slow because their bodies are having to cool themselves. And they're also not acclimated because it's, they've been training in cooler weather. Um, and one of the things that I will note is if you are in a cooler weather environment or cooler weather season, you really want to be conscientious of the timing of your races. So we have seasons here in North Texas, and it does get cooler or colder in the winter. Um, one of my pet peeves with Ironman Texas, which is a great race, but the timing is really challenging if you live in Texas because you've just spent the last six months training in these colder conditions, and we're right at that sort of cusp of it getting warm. One of the reasons why people tend to have a lot of issues with that race because their bodies haven't heat acclimated yet. They haven't had time. And so we'll talk in a little bit about how to do good heat acclimation if you do pick an earlier season race, or if you're picking a race um, in a country or state that is outside of your current, your normal client, where, or it's not client, excuse me, your normal climate, it's been a long day, um, that there are things that you can do at home even if you don't have those temperatures or those humidity conditions. There's still things that you can do as an athlete to prepare for that and get your body ready for that situation. Um, so all of this being said, how do you take action um, in advance to be more successful with the heat, okay? So the first thing is heat acclimation, and that's what we were just talking about. So this needs to happen at least two weeks starting prior to the event, and a lot of my athletes, we do it a couple months prior. Uh, we start doing it in our training sessions. Um, 60 to 90 minute sessions a day. And so these are actually 60 to 90 minute training sessions. Um, the easiest way to start is to do an indoor workout and put a sweatshirt on. And it's gonna be really uncomfortable. If you're on the bike, your power is gonna be low. If you're running, your pace is gonna feel really slow compared to your heart rate. Um, yes, your heart rate will be higher when you're doing heat acclimation um, relative to your power or your pace. And so you just need to be prepared for that. Again, you don't, you're not getting worse your body just has more that it's having to deal with because of the heat that it is having to um, stay cool in spite of. Um, doing a few of these sessions every week leading up to race day is going to do a few things for your body. So one, it's going to increase your sweat rate. So as you start to sweat more, that's actually a good thing. It's a sign of heat acclimation and fitness and it's your body saying, oh, I need to be prepared to cool myself. I would much rather have an athlete who's sweating a lot and their body is doing its job to cool itself and we just have to replace the water and sodium as we go than an athlete who is not sweating and their body is not able to properly cool itself. Yes, one of them needs more water and sodium, but at least we know their body can cool itself as opposed to the other. Um, you're going to see your plasma volume go up and you're going to see your output to heart rate ratio go up. So we just said, 
okay, my power and speed is probably going to be lower um, when it's hotter. But we can mitigate a little bit of that as our body adapts, that maybe we won't be as low power or as low speed if we've done some acclimation in advance. The best thing you can do leading up to a hot weather race is if you can go to the location like two weeks in advance and just be in the heat and do your final sessions in that heat, that is the ideal way to make sure that you are prepared for that race. Hydration. Okay. So this is a really important topic uh, for hot weather training and hot weather racing. And really hydration this time of year, it, it can make or break your race. Um, and there is some strategy to it. It's not just drink lots of water. Because I always feel like if I'm gonna give an, an example, I wanna be able to quantify what I want you to do. Um, and so there are specific things that you can do. So when we look at hydration, the first thing that we have to remember is that hydration is, is how much water you're basically carrying in your systems and your bodies. But when we look at increasing hydration, just drinking water, just replacing water into your body is not enough for those systems to get that water. We need this extra um, substance, which is an electrolyte called sodium. Water plus sodium together get water to the systems that need them, which is all of the systems. Um, and so, so sodium is, is a funny uh, little mineral, so it's an electrolyte, and a lot of times we use the word electrolytes, um, maybe a little bit inappropriately, we say we lose a lot of electrolytes in our sweat, well, actually we lose a lot of sodium in our sweat, and we lose kind of more or less trace amounts of the other electrolytes, and this is really crucial to understand. Um, and the trickier thing about that is that of all the electrolytes, sodium is the main one that you need to absorb the water that you're consuming and send it where it needs to go. And so if, unfortunately, the sweat, which is making you need more water, is also the thing that is getting rid of that electrolyte that you need to absorb the more water that you're taking in. So um, we have to not only replace water, but we have to replace sodium. Um, so that that water is able to get where it needs to go and we don't end up with that condition we talked about earlier, which is hyponatremia, which is where we have lots of water going through our body but not enough sodium to absorb it, which is very dangerous and can lead to hospital visits and worse things. Um, so hydration, our job in hydration is to take in water plus sodium. Okay, so the next question is, well, how much sodium do I need and how much water do I need, right? Because, um, and we'll start with sodium because you, if you've ever looked at sodium products out there, if you're like most athletes, you kind of look at the packaging or the marketing and you're like, oh, this one says it hydrates really well and my friend uses this one and it works really well for them or this one is pretty. Um, you don't necessarily look at the nutrition facts on the back of the product. And you might be really shocked if you go and grab two products off the wall that are both, you know, quote unquote, like electrolyte or sodium replacement. One of those products could have 60 milligrams of sodium per serving, like six zero. Another one could have 1,800. That's, that's a huge difference, right? And so one of the things that we as athletes have to figure out is how much sodium do we personally need to take? And what makes this tricky is we don't all lose sodium in the same quantities in our sweat. Um, so, you know, it's not like we all lose a liter of sweat and lose 500 milligrams of sodium. Um, so we actually, we're fortunate to try, we have a, some performance testing equipment that we purchased last season um, that can tell us how much sodium you lose in your sweat. And um, it's from a company called Precision Hydration and they do a really great job helping athletes be successful um, by letting them know sort of what ratio of sodium to water they need to be able to replace sodium as they're losing in your sweat. And what's really crazy is I might have one person who I do this test on and per liter of sweat, they lose like 400 milligrams of sodium. And I could do, same test on another person, lose a liter of sweat, they could lose 2,200 milligrams of sodium in that liter of sweat. And so those two people need very different products, right? Because for one of them, when they drink about a liter worth of water, or 32 ounces during their rides, they need maybe 400 milligrams of sodium, the other person needs 2,200 milligrams. So they need different products to be successful. Um, I strongly recommend that sodium test. It's um, Normally $200 here, it's $150 right now. Um, but if you don't live in Dallas, there are other places nationally that do it. Just look under precisionhydration.com. Um, if the test isn't in the budget, they do have an online test that they're working on right now. 
um, that can get you probably a pretty good estimate of what you need and some recommendations in terms of amount of sodium to take. So we want to make sure, again, that we're replacing the correct amount of sodium to water so that you can absorb the water that you're drinking. Okay, so that's the sodium, and that's how we figured that part out. Okay, so how much do I need to drink? Because with the sodium, you know, if it's 20 degrees, I'm going to lose the same amount of sodium to sweat as I lose at 100 degrees. But obviously, I'm making a lot more sweat when it's 100 degrees because my body needs to cool itself much more. So in that situation, how do I know how much I need to replace? And that one is actually a little bit more tricky because the amount that you sweat can depend on how heat acclimated you are, right? We just said that as you start to become heat acclimated, you sweat more. So what an athlete needs at the beginning of the summer when they're not sweating as much versus like the end of the summer when they've probably been doing a lot of outside training and they're sweating a lot more is going to be different. What we like to do with our athletes that we've found is really helpful to help them know in general about how much they're going to need is from the very start of the season, and we really try to do this year round if the athlete um, agrees to it, is we have them fill out this nutrition and hydration log. And it's not anything super fancy, but basically we ask them, okay, for all of your like longer rides and runs, what was the temperature? What was the humidity? Um, how many ounces of water did you drink? How many milligrams of sodium did you take per hour? And we ask them to do it just per hour. And then we have them weigh themselves before and after without their kit on because the kit can absorb sweat during the ride. And if they're losing weight with the amount that they're drinking, then we know that at that temperature and humidity, at least on that day, that was not enough to keep them hydrated. Um, now, like we said, those numbers are going to shift, but they're not going to shift that much. And so, you know, if that athlete in the middle of the summer, you know, it's 90 degrees and 60% humidity, they needed 30 ounces of water and 1,000 milligrams of sodium an hour, then for that athlete, if they have similar conditions a few months later, that's probably going to be a reasonable amount for them to carry on the bike or on the run, depending on the race. And so what we do as race day comes closer is we're looking at the forecast and saying, okay, it's going to be this temperature and this humidity. Let's go back in some of those recent logs and see if we have any that were in those similar conditions. And let's see what worked. And then we just take what worked and we apply it to race day with the understanding that the athlete absolutely has room and is allowed to make small adjustments on race day in terms of drinking a little more or drinking a little less if they feel like they need it, right? Because we know that that might not be an exact number, but probably within a few ounces, that's what that athlete is going to need. And I always say that training is, it's a big science project. So basically we collect data and we use it to make decisions and draw conclusions. And so this is one of the ways that we do that. Um, and then the third consideration with hydration, okay, we know how much sodium we need, we know about how much water we're going to need. How are you going to carry it and how are you going to consume it, right? Because in theory, if we're doing a longer race, well, we might need to carry a lot of water. Um, now, a lot of times in triathlon, when we're looking at longer races, we're looking at Ironman, or half Ironman. Those are pretty easy, right? Because they've got water stations every 10 miles and they'll hand you a bottle of water. And if you're not comfortable getting that water in motion, you can stop and take it and refill your stuff. Um, I will say there was a situation at Ironman Texas this year where the A stations ran out of water before the last person came through. Um, so it's definitely good to have a backup plan just in case something goes sideways, you know, putting something in your special needs bags to refill. Uh, maybe carrying an extra 20 ounces of water just to be safe. Um, but if you're not doing Ironman or you're not doing a half Ironman, like let's say you're doing a 100-mile bike race, you may never have an opportunity to refill depending on the race. Um, and so you might need to carry everything on your bike. And so one of the things that you have to do as an athlete is you have to be thinking, okay, for my race, how much water do I have to carry? And then what are my options for carrying that? And, and for me as a coach, I mean, that, looks, that might look like, okay, I'm going to have an athlete who needs to have a total of 60 ounces on the bike and they're doing a race where there's no weight stations. And so what are some containers that make sense from a performance standpoint that will allow them to carry that much? So maybe we'll do like a 40 ounce um, speed fill like triangle container on the frame with the straw that comes up between the handlebars. And then maybe we have like a 24 ounce um, refill bottle on, the re on like a rear hydration that you know, a little ways in, we're going to grab that, we're going to refill the speed fill, put it back, and then just continue to use the speed fill. Um, maybe we're just going to carry two bottles on the bike. Maybe we've got some larger bottles we can use. 
Um, but so thinking about containers that you're comfortable using and making sure that you've got enough for the duration of the bike. Obviously, if there is water on course, we do want to consider that part of the plan because in that situation, you know, yes, maybe I need 100 ounces of water for the bike, but if I don't have to carry 100 ounces of water on my bike, which I'm sure I paid lots of money to have it be you know, nice and lightweight and responsive, um, I would rather not have to do that. So if I have the opportunity to take advantage of on-course hydration, I definitely will coach my athletes to do that when that is an option. Um, in terms of drinking water on the bike, the best option is always something that has a straw right between the handlebars that's like right in your face. And you can sip on it whenever you feel like it. You won't forget to drink water, um, especially if you're on a tri bike and you've paid a lot of money to get your like arrow position dialed in. The last thing you want is every five minutes to have to like sit up and grab a rear hydration bottle and like take a drink and just turn yourself into a giant sail, right? You need to sit up every so often to stretch, but not as often as we should be drinking water. So certainly if you want to stay in position and stay in that more aerodynamic position, we want something with the straw so that you're not having to get up. Also, if you are someone who maybe is newer to cycling and you're not as confident taking the hand off the handlebar, the straw is also a lifesaver because you don't have to worry about, you know, reaching down and then lifting up and putting it back every time you need a drink. Now, I definitely encourage everyone to work on that particular skill just because I think it's an important skill to have in cycling, but I also don't want you to not drink water because you haven't mastered it, okay? Um, another skill that I do recommend working on um, prior to races that do have um, aid stations on the bike, for example, is being able to take what we call hand up, since that's basically where someone is, is reaching out with a water bottle and you're taking it from their hand as you ride by. Obviously, not having to stop and refill and then keep going is going to save you some time on the bike as well. Um, and then what about on the run, right? What if you're doing a run race or you're on the run of a longer triathlon? Um, if there are enough aid stations, ideally we are not carrying water on the run. Now, if it's a race that's a little bit less organized or that's known for running out of stuff, then you may need to carry more. Um, but in a lot of like Ironman events, for example, or big marathons or big half marathons, they're going to have water on the course. And so in that situation, what I'm gonna instruct most of my athletes to do is take a little bit of water at every aid station and then carry salt, excuse me, salt capsules with them that they can kind of just pop at the right times depending on how much sodium they need. So if I have an athlete who needs 500 milligrams of sodium per 16 ounces of water and they have a 250 milligram salt capsule, then you know about every eight ounces of water they drink, they need to take a capsule. Maybe we're getting three to four ounces per aid station just in general. And so they're gonna take a capsule every other aid station because we wanna get the correct amount of sodium in contrast to the water, but then you have to think if I'm carrying capsules, how am I going to carry those? So again, I'm gonna go back to precision hydration because they have a capsule that is in a blister pack. And so it's not gonna get sweaty or gross in your pocket and then melt. Um, you can just pop them out as you go and they're really easy to carry and take. You don't have to worry about it. Um, and then the final consideration I want everyone to have, actually, let me say one more thing about in-race and in-training hydration. Um, don't wait until you're thirsty to start hydrating. As soon as you get on the bike, you are hydrating in a triathlon. Um, you're not waiting till the end to take a little sip, especially long course. Like you get your heart rate down and you start hydrating. Same thing with the food, by the way. Um, and same thing on the run, like you're hydrating a little bit the whole way, because what you don't want is to get to a point where you need a lot of water that you're gonna basically have to either stop or go super slow to actually Right? We want to take them a little bit at a time so our body has a chance to absorb it, use it, and then move on to the next step, basically. So final thing on hydration is this idea of what we of preloading. And it's a fairly old concept. It's been around for a while. And basically what it means is that um, a little bit before the event, maybe even starting the night before, we are having some water with extra sodium in it to sort of, again, bring the blood uh, plasma volume up and just sort of get the body sort of extra prepped with sodium um, for race day. And so Precision, for example, recommends doing um, 16 ounces of water with, they have a little tablet that has 750 milligrams of sodium in it. We've been testing that for the last year or so, and a lot of our athletes have really liked it. And so we do their recommendation where the night before the race, they have a bottle like this, and then the morning of the race, they have a bottle like that maybe two or three hours before around the same time they have breakfast. And that works really well. 
Um, you can also do that for longer, harder, hotter training sessions as well. So for myself personally, um, I will be in Lubbock and I've been talked into doing the relay, the run leg at Lubbock. And so for all of my long runs this year, because we have had some pretty hot days on Sundays, which is the day that I've been able to do those, um, 90 minutes to two hours before I've had my bottle of water with my sodium and it has made a really big difference. And I think there was one day that I didn't have it and um, I, it was a marked difference. So I do encourage you to do a little bit of preloading as well so that you get out on the course knowing that your body is fully hydrated and ready to go. The last thing you want is to um, already be in a hole starting the race. And of course, we want you to be hydrating throughout the day and making sure that you're getting a little bit of sodium with your food, um, maybe even in your water if you have a job that has you outside all day. Um, being hydrated throughout the day is the first step in being prepared to train and race effectively. And you will notice a difference in your training sessions and in your competitions if you are not diligent about staying hydrated throughout the day. So the next topic I do want to touch on is sunscreen. Um, so we have this kind of interesting thing to talk about with sunscreen because there's a new study out that tells us some things that we didn't really even know yet uh, that are kind of exciting. Um, but the first note on sunscreen that I do want to make is you really don't need to go over SPF 30. Um, actually, once you get above SPF 30, some of the higher SPFs actually in a lot of situations contain um, products that are maybe not as healthy or not good for your skin or not good for your body. Um, and the amount of improved protection you get is very, very low, like 1% or 2%. So usually SPF 30 is kind of the magic number in terms of product. Um, obviously, sunscreen, sunscreen can prevent your skin from short-term and long-term damage, including cancer. So uh, we want to be using it from a long-term standpoint. But one of the things that we've just learned, and there's a new study out, and if you're interested in the study, let me know, and I can send you a link to it. Um, but as we've learned that sunscreen may actually also assist in keeping our blood flow higher and our blood pressure down by helping to keep our capillaries open. And so we just talked about one of the things that happens in hotter weather being um, decreased blood flow. Well, sunscreen may actually help fight that. So if you wanna work on your tan, during the race is not the time to do it. Um, we know now that there's a lot of good reasons why um, protecting our skin during the race can lead to um, not only long-term better health, but could actually lead to better performance on race day by keeping that blood flow going. Um, you do, the guideline for sunscreen is that you want to reapply every two hours. I know most of you are not going to reapply halfway through your bike in a half Ironman. Um, there's a product that we really like here at Playtry that has a much lower reapplication rate. It's called Zelios, Z-E-A-L-I-O-S. And essentially their protocol is you put it on the night before and then you put on a, like a second layer uh, race morning. And we have had really, really positive initial reports from athletes utilizing it that it really has done a good job protecting their, their skin throughout the course of the race. And so that might be a good product to look into if you don't have a sunscreen currently that you like to use when you're competing. Okay, so apparel choices. So speaking also of, of protecting our skin, um, Obviously, lighter fabrics in general. I will say there are some black fabrics out there right now that are specifically cooling fabrics and that have specific you know, compounds or um, chemicals that are, are sort of used in the production of the fabric that actually will help you cool, like a lighter fabric. So, um, for example, Two Times U has their, I think they call it their Isex fabric, and it is black, but it also does cool. So, um, in general, there are some options out there that are darker, but in general, all things equal. Lighter fabrics, obviously, are going to reflect the sun and going to be a little bit easier um, to keep cool with. Um, wicking fabrics, so obviously, I, I think we all know at this point, but no cotton <laughs> um, on race day and definitely not in hot weather. There's a lot of other reasons not to do it, um, but especially for keeping cool and letting your um, sweat wick away so that your body can create more and get the cooling effect. Wicking fabrics are crucial. Um, and some other things that I recommend, like I recommend wearing um, actually like the full sleeves for really full sun. Um, so they have like cooling sleeves and they're just white mesh. Um, sometimes they're mesh, sometimes they're just more of like a typical wicking fabric. Um, and that has that same sunscreen effect. Uh, so if you don't want to do sunscreen on the arms, you can do a cloth instead. Those can also be nice because at an aid station, you can like put icy water on them and then you have 
um, that effect of the uh, conduction where we're cooling by losing heat by you know, contact with a colder object. Um, so that's something you can do. I like um, hats with a like technical um, like wicking fabric inside on race day because on the run you can get ice at aid stations a lot of times. Put ice in your hat, put it back on, and then again you've got that convection happening um, on your head. Um, and so just wearing things that are going to, one, allow your skin to perspire and not have chafing issues, two, that are going to protect your skin from the sun, um, and three, anything that can facilitate additional cooling methods um, by holding ice or water or other cool things that can help draw heat away from the body. Um, and then this is a silly one, but we're talking about things that can make it easier to deal with the heat. And uh, one of the things that you'll see is be more fit. <laughs> so athletes that are in better shape tend to deal better than with heat than athletes that aren't in better shape, that are training in the same conditions. And, you know, I really do always feel like there, there are all these things that you need to be prepared for heat. Um, but one of the things that you need to do is be prepared for your race, right? Um, the heat's going to have a bigger impact on you if you're doing something that you're not prepared for than if you're doing something that you are prepared for. Another thing to make sure you do, and this is one that a lot of people don't know about or think about, is to check your medications. Um, so there are actually a lot of medications out there, some of them that are fairly common, that can actually impair your ability to sweat. So if you are taking a specific medication, um, there's some allergy medications, for example, that, that do this. Ask your doctor, or, or look, I guess look it up, but I always encourage you to ask the doctor or the pharmacist first if it, if it has an impact on your ability to sweat, because if it does, maybe there's an alternate that you could use that would not have that same impact. And then finally, and this is the hardest one for triathletes or probably any athlete, um, is patience. So give your body time to acclimate, right? Plan ahead, you know, give your body time to acclimate. Don't expect to do a lot of cool weather training and then have the first hot session you do feel great. You could do everything right that session. You could hydrate, you could wear the right things, you could you know, have the cooling wrap and have the ice in the hat, you're still not going to perform as well as you would in the cool weather. And that's okay. That's part of the process. Um, don't push through symptoms, right? If you're having a symptom, find a way to treat it, right? Now, I'm not saying don't finish the workout or don't, need what, don't do the work that you need to do, but also don't be afraid to listen to your body and say, hey, you know what, this seems like it's a little bit more than what's helpful. Address it. Okay, or if you need to pull back and get your heart rate down before you kind of keep pushing, that's okay too. Don't be afraid to listen to your body and respond appropriately. Um, and then one of the last things we say to athletes, like we want you to race hard, but we also want you to race smart, right? So we've just talked about all of these things that you can do to sort of help your body handle the heat better. Um, things that you can do initially, things that you can do on race day or in the training sessions. Do those things, um, and it does require a little bit of extra planning. You know, it's not like a race where it's 40 degrees and you just throw on whatever you're going to wear and go do the thing. You do have to do a little bit more on the outset, but the rewards when you feel good towards the end of the race or the end of the training session and you can complete it and execute it the way that you want it to, it's worth it. So be patient with the process. Do what you need to do to help yourself be successful. Um, so now I want to go okay, maybe we didn't do the things that we needed to do. We weren't patient. We made some bad choices in the training session. We made some bad choices on race day. We want to talk about some symptoms um, that could potentially be signs of those more dangerous conditions that we mentioned at the beginning. These are situations where it's time to either slow down or maybe even stop and recover entirely. So um, these aren't the fun things to talk about, but you do need to know when something is wrong. Okay. Um, some major symptoms that you might see from heat illness, nausea and diarrhea, um, dizziness, rapid pulse. Um, so rapid pulse doesn't mean, I, I do want to note, that's not just a heart rate that's a little bit higher. That is like a lot higher. Um, your heart rate will, like we said, trend a little bit higher um, compared to power or pace in the heat. Um, but if it's significantly higher, that's when we, that might be a sign of a problem. Um, confusion, headache, fainting. Obviously, if you fainted, you're going to take a break. It's not really a choice, but um, unusual fatigue, right? So obviously, you're going to feel tired during an Ironman, but there are times where you feel it's more severe than just, I'm, I'm having a long training day or I'm having a long race. Um, and then cramping, of course. I feel like fainting and cramping, it's like, well, 
obviously you're going to take a break because you don't really have a choice, but they still can be symptoms. You know, I would say if you have one of these symptoms, like maybe your gut's a little upset, well, that could be because you had too many these, right? Maybe uh, you have cramping. It could be because you didn't taper properly through it. Like all of, a lot of these symptoms by themselves could be caused by multiple things. But if you have multiple symptoms together, and especially if you have like chills or your skin gets cold, and your lips are dry, there's sort of all these little things that added together it's time to stop. And, you know, I think as triathletes, we're known for, um, for pushing through. And I, I forget who it was. Someone on social media yesterday actually saw this, talked about, you know, uh, triathletes being stubborn, but there's this fine line between stubborn and stupid. And, and it really is true. And I think that all of us as triathletes have probably crossed that line at some point. Um, but heat is not the place to cross that line because it really is um, easy to get into dangerous situations. And so, if you're having any of these symptoms, it's, it really is time to get help. Um, you know, something, whether you did, every, even if you did everything right at the beginning, it maybe it's just not your day. Um, and so this is just me asking you <laughs> to please listen to your body and be respectful of what it's telling you and live to fight another day. Um, if you do get these symptoms and you do need to stop, things that you can do to recover, and certainly if you're at a race, um, the med tent or the medics that are on site are going to help facilitate, are going to facilitate these things for you. But if you are not racing or no one's there or you're doing a training session, you may need to make these things happen for yourself. Um, the first thing, obviously, is find a protected shaded spot, preferably with AC. So if you're in the neighborhood, maybe you go knock on someone's door if you're comfortable doing that. If your car is nearby, get your car, turn it on, turn on the AC. If there's a public building like a church or a gas station or a drugstore, just get inside. Um, try and sit in front of a fan where you've got some movement so that you're getting um, that convection uh, where you're having the airwaves against your skin sort of drawing the heat away. Try to drink some cool fluids with a little bit of sodium. Drink slowly. If you drink super fast, it will probably make you feel more nauseated, but try to just sip on that. Um, Try to, if you, if you can get like some cold, um, like water soaked, like paper towels or towels or something to put on your skin. Um, certainly if you have the option, like if you're on a race site and there's a colder body of water, it might be good to go some water or if they have like ice tubs or ice baths to get in there. Um, and then loosen your clothing. So if you have like the tight tri suit on, um, if, if you can, you may want to like zip down the top and just kind of expose your skin so that it can breathe. Um, and so those are all things that you can do. Or if you see someone else who's having a reaction, those are things that you can help them do to get out of that situation a little bit more safely. So that is all that I had to discuss today. Um, we do have about 10 minutes left, so I am going to open it up. If anyone has specific questions about dealing with the heat, um, you can type those in. I'll wait for a couple of minutes to see if anyone has specific questions, and I'll do my best to answer them for you. All right, well, I'm going to take the lack of questions as a sign that there are no questions. So thank you guys so much for joining us this evening. Um, there will be a recording of this video available uh, via the event, probably within the next hour or two. And if you do have individual questions, um, feel free to uh, message the Play Party FW, or you can message me, Morgan Johnson Hoffman, or you can email me. Morgan at playtry.com. Thank you guys so much for your time. And if you're racing in Lubbock, I will see you there. Have a great night.